Hi, I'm Steve Lesson I'm from the University of Reading. And over the last hour, what we've been talking about is the way that the university has such transformative potential to work with the local community. We've been thinking about the work that we've been doing as academics, but also the way we were working with undergraduate students on a whole series of research projects out in the local community around Reading that we hope will make a practical difference and get beyond and the university thinking very esoterically and theoretically about the kind of contribution that we can make. So one of the people that we've been working with is Dan Mitchell. Um, and Dan, why don't you tell us a bit more about some of the research that you've been doing. Hi, I'm Dan. Um, I've been working as a, on an internship funded by the University of Reading. Um, we've worked with local community and local students at colleges on publicising the project that we've been working on, including making a Facebook page, a Twitter page and a blog. Um, and we've also done a lot of research with the local community, and that's what Sally is going to talk about now. The project we've been working on is for the Whitley Big Local, and that is uh, Whitley, Whitley is ge being given a million pounds to actually improve the lives of local families. Um, we've set up a network with the community called the Whitley Researchers, and we've been working on participatory methods to actually enable the communities to decide about where that money goes, supporting them, and this has massive implications in terms of thinking about the links between academics and local communities, about the politics of participation, and rethinking about community development in the UK. My background was in um, the Global South. So I teach, still teach geography development, um, and much of my research was on the informal economy, on community development, on gender and development in Latin America and the Caribbean, and this was largely done in the 1990s. Um, at the same time, when I came to Reading, I found that there were a number of issues and uh, research projects happening locally that required the same set of inputs and methodologies and ideas. And I started working very much with Reading Borough. I worked with Sophie in the 1990s on um, thinking about uh, migrant communities and accessing to services. Um, we worked on labour markets and young people's aspirations. Um, and so there's a kind of uh, a long history of me working in what we used to call the university outreach. So it wasn't that long ago when I, when I did my promotion case in, in 2012 and there was a big category and I had to talk about outreach. Uh, now we're talking about impact, uh, the impact agenda. But it's something I've always done. So I've got long-standing existing partnerships with Reading Voluntary Action, loads of community organisations uh, and uh, organisations within Reading and also within the South East. So I'm somebody that if uh, a team or a community group wants some research done, they will often come to me and say, well, how do we do this? Can you help us? Uh, some of this is part of my sort of activism. So I do a lot of volunteering on this as well. And so this is what very much led uh, for me to be approached by the big local team that we'll talk about, I'll talk about in a minute. The community came to me and said, we've got this money, we've got this agenda. Can you help us do some work with the community in order to us to realise what we want out of this? And so that's my kind of background in this. And I'll talk a bit more about that project in a minute. So I think that leads us to think about some more recent catalysts for the work that we're doing. So part of this is to say that um, this will come through when we talk about some of the methods that we're using that Sally in particular and me to a lesser extent have some history, um, some connections, and kind of a track record of doing, of doing work in and around Reading. <coughs> and those personal connections, some of which we share, some of which we have our own networks, are important. For me, um, I started doing work in Reading predominantly um, following approaches, quite speculative approaches from the local authority, which were around the local authority not really having many people left working for them to do some of the things that they needed to do. Um, there's a, 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 an ethical issue, I think, around, uh, around to what extent we might use undergraduate researchers in um, community and other organisations um, to do work that might otherwise have been done by somebody who's employed in those organisations. But um, Reading Borough um, approached us to do some census work, and based on some of those contacts, um, I began to do more work, especially in South Reading, some work in Whitley. And um, when George Marston, who was the Dean of Science, left, I inherited some of his roles in regarding widening participation and um, involving some charities, um, two charities in, in South Reading. And so really out of that, quite, um, it was quite unplanned and it was a, a, a quite sort of reactionary sort of process. I started also to do some work and to become more involved in outreach and engagement around in, in the South Reading area. So I think that there are at least two other drivers for what we're doing. And the first is 
that both Sally and I are intensively involved in undergraduate, um, undergraduate teaching and undergraduate supervision. And so across the university, an increasing emphasis on undergraduate research and um, funds and schemes that enable that has been an important driver of our project. So a lot of the research that we're going to talk about has actually been done by students or by other kind of non-professional um, researchers. And so, that, and so that employability, placement, internship agenda has been an important driver of what we're doing too. We'll talk more about that later. And as I said, for both of Sally and I, I think we're talking a bit about um, working with similar people but from different directions. So we, both Sally and I, share a kind of network of contacts, but often I've come to those people quite independently and are starting now to join some of those opportunities together a bit more. Did you want to say something about stigmatisation? Like? I did. Um, so one of the uh, issues about working in Whitley, for those of you that know Whitley, Whitley is a community uh, that's very close to us. It's been heavily stigmatised. Um, I'm not going to say too much about the kind of measures of deprivation, but whichever way you look at it, Whitley is often seen as one of the most deprived communities in Reading and also with, with, for some indicators within the South East particularly in terms of um, access to higher education, qualifications, numbers of uh, community members with health, ill health or disability issues. Um, it's a, it's a, a neighbourhood that has been under the watch of local government, of social scientists, um, for many, many years. And so what we don't want to do with some of this work is to further add to the othering of Whitley as, a, as another place. What we want to do is think about ways of of working with a community and affecting social change without coming, without joining that kind of very top-down kind of discourse which is to some extent still operating within uh, local governments, within other kinds of community and kind of governance strategies about how do you solve Whitley, how do you solve some of the problems of unemployment, um, how do you raise aspirations and I hope that the way that we've done some of this and particularly the way that we, we've worked on the big local actually seeks to destabilize some of this and challenge some of those, um, some of those kind of viewpoints um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. I think that connects to um, a body of work in more critical urban studies which is around um, working against the stigmatisation of place and by mm. kind of um, calling somewhere out as a problematic place somewhere that needs to be intervened in um, one can reinforce and, um, and deepen some of those processes and, mm. and one of the things that we're keen to do therefore mm. is to work against that. So, yeah, you thank you. About the yeah. So, the Whitley Big Local is a project that I've been working on. Um, just over a year ago, members of the community and a big local representative, a guy called John Ord, who some of you uh, might know because he's actually quite an activist um, within this area, um, came to me and asked if I would help the community think about ways they would spend a million pounds. So Whitley had been given, they'd, they'd bid for it, uh, to a fund for the National Lottery that was funding originally 100 communities, they just extended that to 150 communities, whereby they put a million pounds in the hands of the people. Now, one of the points of this research um, and the points of this project was to bypass the local state and some of the stakeholders that we've been talking about and actually give money to the community themselves. And so the key part of this was to empower, to empower the communities, get them to think about what they needed to spend to make Whitley a better place to live for them, for families. But in order to do that, they wanted to do some research. They wanted to find out about people's needs, their experiences, their hopes, their fears, their aspirations, and they wanted some guidance on that. And so it sounded like the sort of project that I'd love to be involved in, so I said I, I agreed to do that. And one of the starting points on that is that rather than come at this from a, a very typical kind of university-led uh, research project, which would be possibly me as the kind of PI and employing some postgraduate students and going into Whitley, um, I wanted it to be a participatory action research project, which actually um, trained up and enabled local residents to do the research themselves. So uh, that's what we did. We advertised uh, and we actually paid... Um, Dan's going to talk a bit more about this in a minute. We actually used the money to pay uh, local residents a living wage to do the research. And I myself just ran, with the help of some of the students, we ran training here. We've had training in this very room. We've done training on focus groups, how to set up an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and we'd partner them and go hand in hand in the community. 
And through that project over a year, we've come up, I think, with a very good model and a network of trained researchers in the community that are now empowered to take some of this research into the next level. And in fact, they've just come up with their first community plan, which they launched recently, recently to actually bid for some of that money. What do they want to spend it on? And the sorts of things that they're interested in are setting out a community transport service. They want to set up a credit union because one of the big issues for Whitley is kind of payday loan, loans. And, you know, there's, uh, many people are financially excluded. Um, and also, there's been a launch, I don't know if anyone's heard of the community cafe, uh, we're revamping the, um, the community centre. And all this is going on from within the, within the community. Now, the bit that they really wanted help from the university is they wanted to look into the feasibility of doing a transport, a community transport scheme. Would it work? And in order to do that, we need to find out where people go. Uh, where they go, where they want to go, are there any mobility barriers that people are facing and what are the links between not being able to get where you need to go to other forms of exclusion, to jobs, to work, to aspirations, to, to life enhancing experiences. Um, so that was the project and it's been a project that's taken place this year. Um, Daniel's going to talk in a minute about who that, the network consists of but all suffice to say we managed to do 500 questionnaires which is quite, a, you know, there's 2,000, 12,000 um, people in Whitley, 4,000 4, households. It's quite a reasonable size questionnaire. So we've got in-depth data on the mobility patterns of 500 people and their families. We did 25 interviews. We went into everywhere. We went to community organisations. Uh, we went to schools. We've built up this partnership, and we've also interviewed all the statutories. So we're in a process now. We have that massive body of data, and we're just in the process uh, of putting that together and, and writing a final report that will go into recommendations about where this some of this money will be spent, and that will actually be done after Easter. And then the community themselves will be setting up a transport scheme in order to take this further. But uh, what I'd like to do now is pass you over to Daniel Mitchell. So Daniel Mitchell, I had three internships paid for by the university, one of which was from Sages last year. Daniel was one of the interns. Um, he was in his final year working on the project. He's going to talk to you a bit about what Whit Whitley Researchers is all about and a bit more about our networks and what it was like to be an intern on the project. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so the Whitley Researchers, as Sally mentioned, was a group of people um, that paid their own living wage. Um, and we've been working with them, um, formed a partnership with them, uh, so it's staff and students from the University of Reading, NCA and John Orr's, and we've been working with them just to go through the project um, and help them with research and things like that. Um, and they've actually now gone on to get uh, other research and con consultation work from everything that we've done with them. Um, so things that included were, we went down to NCA to talk about social media, um, which we learned a lot from as well, so it's not just us helping them, it's them helping us in, in, in return. Um, and we've been to fortnightly meetings down at Hexham Community Centre, um, which was just discuss the process, uh, progress of the project, um, talk about new ideas, where we go forward, what help we can give each other. Um, and also it ended up with a, a research day here at the University of Reading, where we talked about um, more than a, uh, how a university is more than a dream, trying to destigmatize about the costs and things like that, and it was well received. Um, also presented our uh, initial findings and talked about focus groups, and then finished off with a campus tour. And a lot of people that came from uh, the Sunderland Training Academy had never actually been to the university before, um, and a lot of the community people they didn't actually know they could come on to the university if they allowed, and it changed a lot of people's opinions. Um, other things that we've done um, include going to a uh, community centre, um, kind of uh, annual thing. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, we've got involved in sort of a community centre trust. So we now go, when they have their meetings, we go and present, we go and provide support uh, when, when people need. Um, it's worth saying that Northumberland Training Academy is a sixth form college on Northumberland Avenue. And uh, they were really keen to partner with us because they are a, an organisation which don't often, many of their students wouldn't normally go to university. And actually, you know, they're really keen to have those kinds of links. And so we've involved, their six formers have been doing the research as well. So um, the way we are with the Whitley researchers at the moment, and Steve will talk about this, we're, we're getting other um, ideas for work. 
Right, so I, we'd really like to keep this going. We've got ideas of possibly turning this into a social enterprise, a model for working, with the idea that this could be used in other parts of Reading. We could grow it. We've got the basis. We know what we, want, what we need to do. And we've got some kind of training ideas on this as well. So, uh, um, Just one final thing. Um, that it's helped us build lots of different partnerships as well. So obviously we've got a partnership with, with this group, but it's also been out in the community with Reading Bus, Reading Buses, the council, and just generally getting to know a lot of people in the area. Uh, I'm just going to say a little bit about publicising projects as well. So we work with the students at NCA and we come up with Facebook pages, Twitter pages, and we created a blog about everything that we were doing. So it allowed people from the community, the students, staff, anyone to contribute to the blog. Um, I think as of last week we had about 550 hits about people that have been reading about what, what we've been up to. Thank you, Daniel. So I just want to say something. Um, I, I want to pick up on a couple of things that... Um, that Dan talked about, um, especially in terms of um, outreach in Britain. I want to say something first, just briefly, about the, about the politics of the big local, and to say that um, the big local, the um, National Lottery funded million pound scheme that, um, that Sally's been working on, um, is, a, is a super local initiative. And it's one that um, puts quite a large amount of money, uh, a million pounds, directly into a community and puts in a, its own system of um, decision making and, and organisation that, that sits outside the local authority and in some respects this is consistent with um, some wider elements of coalition government policy that I'll say something about later on but I sit in a lot of meetings um, that involve people from the local authority in Whitley and something that we hear a lot about is kind of what the big local is and what it's doing and wh where this money is going and what's going to happen to um, who's deciding um, what, what, the sort of spending priorities and what, what is this research? Have you seen the survey in the local paper? What's this, what's this about? And I kind of think that that's indicative in, to, to an extent of the, of the challenge of participatory and um, community based um, agenda setting to local authorities. So much of the um, policy interventions in Whitley over 40 years or more have come from and been extremely well directed, don't get me wrong, by the local authority, but tend to be, um, to view policy makers as experts, as agenda setting, and intervening locally. And, and the big local um, is a challenge to that, and is a lot more about um, enabling local communi a, a community to, to set its own research agenda. And so some of the, the tensions that are inherent to localism in Britain more generally that I'll talk about later have played out in the big local. I think it's a an interesting insight into the way in which some of these things work in its own right, and something that stands at odds with some of the more classificatory kind of agenda setting literature that tends to deal more with the policy structures and less with the kind of micro geographies and outcomes of these things. So I'll say more about that in a minute. I wanted to say something first though about work that I've been doing around widening participation. Um, and in particular, work that I've been doing um, with Aspire 2, and I've just realised that I've got 200 lottery tickets um, to sell for their Grand Easter raffle, and I'm going to sell them to you today, I've forgotten to bring them, but I'll, I'll be back with those, um, because kind of doing a lot, of, a lot of the work that I'm doing in South Reading with Aspire 2 has an incredibly practical edge to it, and so Sue Beasley's um, ordering t-shirts, and I'm um, selling lottery tickets, and a lot, of it, a lot of the work that we're doing is incredibly practical and outcome focused. And my role tends to be in signposting um, people in schools and in and charitable organisations in South Reading into the university, which it's increasingly apparent to me is, is viewed locally as a kind of huge resource, both a, a spatial resource, a green space, but as a source of funding too. So, um, we're talking here about an organisation that maybe has a turnover of £15,000 a year. Um, and, and I've got a budget from the university of £45,000 to work with them. So I, I, when I come to the meetings, I, they must see kind of pound signs coming into the room. And it's interesting to think about the role of the university in the local community through the lens of widening participation and through my involvement in Aspire to, which is a charitable organisation that aims to work with children in local schools to raise their educational attainment and more than that, to, to, to broaden their worldview 
and their experience. Um, for some of these people, even um, go, venturing outside Whitley across the Sheffield Road to the campus, as, as Dan alluded to, is quite a challenge. Lots mm -hmm. of people um, live in a very small life world in this sort of area. So some of the work that mm -hmm. I've been doing has involved working with undergraduate researchers to get things done. So it involves working on internships and quite task-based projects locally. Um, there's also funded through the university's widening participation fund a PhD studentship, which I co-supervise with Carol Fuller at the Institute of Education. And we're thinking in particular about, in the context of Whitley, um, which Carol, um, where Carol also has a, a long 20, 30 year history of working as a local resident, we've thought a lot about the, the, the potential of working not through schools but with individual families and with parents to raise educational attainment. So a lot of the work that we've been doing there has been focused on widening participation. There's a kind of University of Reading organisational element to this too though, which is that within the university as a whole, the ideas of widening participation and outreach are heavily associated with student recruitment and widening participation sits firmly within the kind of recruiting um, within, within the student recruitment office. And one concern um, that I have through this work is to try and move the focus of that away from being about um, bringing students into the university and more into the, to think more about the university's potential, transformative potential in the local community and the civic role of the university. I'll say something more about that in a minute. The last thing I wanted to talk about was a, a parallel project that I don't see as particularly separate to this around working with undergraduate researchers and transforming undergraduate research. It's something that I have a professional involvement with. Um, I'm a editor of a undergraduate research journal called Geoverse, which aims to publicize and make visible undergraduate research. I've been funded um, to, through a higher education academy training event to develop undergraduate research across the University of Reading. I think that using student researchers is fundamental to the sort of work that I'm doing at the moment. And as we'll say right towards the end of the presentation, it's something that doesn't sit comfortably with the kind of um, way that we, we might view research and what's valid and what constitutes um, kind of professional and rigorous research of a high standard. It problematizes that to some respect, in some respects. So I want to just make clear that a lot of the work that I'm doing involves working with undergraduate students, which fits neatly into some strategic priorities across the university and, and outside the university too, in geography as a whole, about raising the, about increasing the authenticity of undergraduate research and around increasing the visibility and the status of undergraduates and researchers, which I'll, I'll say something about as we move along too. Thank you. One of the things that kind of under, underscores all of this, in terms of thinking a little bit more about our research and about impact and about British geography, is about participation. Now, for those of you that are sitting from the context of working in the global south, you'll probably be sitting here thinking, well, this is nothing new. <laughs> this is what we do. This is how we run product. Product, you know, projects, um, and actually there have been many examples whereby the local state have been bypassed, you know, community projects um, have been well established since the 1950s and 60s, and the point I think I want to make is, that, is there's a disjuncture between research, theory, and conceptualization between the work in the global south and the work in the global north, and I think as somebody that kind of spans those kind of spaces, um, I'm well placed to kind of to, to develop some of this further. Um, work on participatory development in the UK is still seen, it's still does seen as relatively novel. The Whitley researchers are seen as new and exciting within the kind of um, the local authority and with the community development sphere here. Whereas if I was working in Trinidad, this was stuff I was doing in 1990. Um, and I think there's an interesting set of discourses to be sort of unraveled about the, why we don't use the knowledge that's built and the, the expertise from the global south and the use of local knowledge in also to inform what we're actually doing here within the UK and working with disadvantaged communities within our own kind of spaces. Now, we know that research subjects, um, that be, if you let them to become producers of knowledge and research, then community projects are more likely to be successful. They're more likely to buy into them. It's more likely to have outcomes that you want to achieve in terms of empowering and developing. 
Um, and there's, a, there's some good work starting to come out in a UK context, work by Askins and people like Rachel Payne. I work with Rachel Payne. and We've actually organised a number of sessions at the IBG over the last few years about these issues, about what it means to participate in the global north, about um, what impact really is when we're working with those communities. But I think there's a lot more to be done. There's some interesting work around um, what people are talking about, the messy spaces of encounter. You know, the real difficulties in actually doing that work. These uh, running participatory projects are fraud. There's power relations, there are dynamics. It's incredibly difficult to listen to everybody's voice. To some extent, how participatory are we being? I'm still at the university, I'm still running these projects. These are issues that need debating. They've been well debated in the Global South, but they need pulling out. So one of the things I would like to do, and I'll talk about that at the very end, there is room to produce some papers on this, tying up some of these kind of discourses. Um, because we are, within the impact agenda, we're talking about co-production of knowledge as if it's something that's just come out of the last ref. And actually, to some extent, maybe it's, uh, it's, it has a, a kind of a exciting kind of new flavour within the global north, but I think there's a lot we can learn from the kind of community projects, and I'll come back on that to, to, in a minute. Of course, these things aren't unproblematic. They're terribly time-consuming. I spent every Friday of last year in the community centre. And uh, Lorna, who's also turned up, she's part, she was helping us with this. We'll, we'll talk probably also about the lengthy meetings and the discussions we had about who wanted to do what, whose ideas were the best. We had a questionnaire that we wanted to do. We went through so many versions because we wanted to listen to everybody's point of view. But what we just realised that nobody was making a decision. We weren't moving on. So what are the politics of participation in actually doing and getting things done and meeting those agendas? And I can see people kind of nodding from their own experiences and it'll be interesting to talk about that. But again, these are some, people aren't writing about this within this context. So I think there's some room to do that within kind of the UK kind of scene at the moment. Um, and for me, um, the things that are coming out of the project, and I'll just talk very quickly about that, is the importance of mobility. Okay? You've got a so-called disadvantaged community. If you can't get where you need to go, that actually limits everything else you do, where you buy your food, whether you eat healthily, whether your kids can go to school, whether you have opportunities to get out of, out of Reading and see what the world has to offer you. And what we found is that people without cars, and that's about half our sample didn't have a car, women with families, particularly there's a gender dynamic to this, um, aren't able to um, experience the kind of everyday things that we take for granted. And it's really important. Uh, if you talk to schools and teachers, and we've done focus groups with young people, they will talk about the fact that they don't get out of their community. Some children have never left Reading. And when you look at the kind of daily journeys and the patterns within the community, you will find that a lot of that exists within that community because they are disconnected. The buses run, but what if you can't afford the bus? Um, the buses don't run, they, you know, I'll be doing another seminar on this probably next term, but you know, the buses run outside the community, they don't, they don't run through it. So for many people, they can't get out. Some children have never been to the sea, they've never experienced um, days out. So these sorts of things, the everyday doing family, the everyday mobilities are some of the issues that um, interest me. And in some, some of the, the forums I'm working with, within sort of the gender um, frameworks of working with British geographers, we talk about the kind of intimate politics, if you like, the politics of doing family and the household, how that links up to kind of wider justices and how something very fundamental like the Reading Town Centre actually impacts on all of that. So those are sort of some of the things that I would like to take forward um, in thinking about kind of research spaces on that. And I will return to that um, after Steve has talked a bit about how participation then feeds into kind of undergraduate research and, and the kind of problems and opportunities that working with undergraduates actually presents. So I don't want to say too much about this. Thank you. I, I, I want to um, make two main points. And the first is to say that in thinking through some of the opportunities and challenges of using, uh, using working with undergraduate researchers um, in, um, in some of the projects that, that we've, that we've um, begun and we're working on at the moment. There are parallels and in increasingly it's apparent there are similarities in some of the methodological issues, some of the ethical issues, so, some of, the, um, so, so, some of um, what we're thinking about in terms of the validity and the, and the kind of um, acceptability of research 
that cut across um, some of the participatory methodologies that Sally's worked on previously and some of the sorts of things that, that I'm encountering and some of the work that I'm doing in promoting undergraduate research. The second thing I want to say, though, is that it's also apparent, increasingly so in the work that we're doing, that the university um, has a transformative potential in Whitley and in the, and, and, and in the local community that we can build on and that we'd like to use going forward. In some respects, this um, developed some ideas coming out of the United States predominantly about the kind of third mission of universities, the idea that a university isn't just about teaching and research, but it's about community transformation, a kind of return to ideas of universities as civic institutions. In part, I'm also interested in thinking about the transformative potential that um, our students have at the university. But in, in a lot of the research, a lot of the work that I'm familiar with, students kind of get a bad rep as neighbors. They're the people that don't empty their bins, they're the people that don't cut their hedge, and they're the people that make your community like a ghost town over the summer. But in some of the work that we've been doing, especially with RUSA, in thinking about their outreach and engagement work, it's apparent that there's enormous potential and um, transformation with potential that our students have in the local community too. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things um, that I'd like to do is to enhance the authenticity and the visibility of our students as researchers, both in our research communities and, and in the local community um, too, because I think that one of the things that I've encountered in working with organisations in South Reading is just the, the um, amount of um, the, the kind of ideas that are there for work that could be done that would have genuine impact, but the lack of capacity to do it. And, and Sally and I certainly don't have the, the time or ability to do that. You know, we don't have the time or ability to sit down and eat lunch in those days, but there are a lot of students at the university that we feel that we could work with and through um, as a way of affecting this transformation and rethinking um, the, the mission of the university and the role of the students in relation to the local community. Um, so... I don't, I don't think I'm going to say a lot more about that. I think I want to move on and say that one of the things that we've encountered in beginning to do, we probably worked on 10 or 12 different small projects around and about South Reading over the last year. Some paid, some unpaid, um, but, but, but often very purpose specific. And one thing that we're starting to experience now is just a huge growth in demand for more work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, I've got a series of eight funded internships that have come out of working with local schools I'd like to work on over the summer. No idea who's going to supervise those. I've no idea even where we're going to get the students to sit to do them. But there's a lot of demand coming out for that. Sally, I know you've been getting a lot of interest in the research team that you've got. Yeah, so um, with Whitley researchers, what we found is a lot of people from local council were coming to them saying, actually, that's really interesting. We've got some funds. Could you do that for us? Actually, we want a project on employment, or we want to look at needs. You know, young people, they're not in um, training or... Um, um, uh, or education and so there's, there's quite a lot of demand and I'm really passionate to keep this going um, but the point about all of this is mm -hmm. that it's very time consuming and actually it's starting to go like this to the extent that most days of the week now Steve and I are being called upon um, can you come down to JMA can you there's something going on at NTA can you just pop down and support our local community and so this is slightly getting uh, it's slightly getting too big in a sense, for us to kind of manage on our own, which is why we decided we needed a to start thinking about a kind of strategy for this and to focus on, on certain areas. So, but I'm very passionate about keeping the Whitley researchers going. Um, many of the researchers, the residents, have gone on to get other jobs now because of their, because of their experience, but there'll be, there'll be other interests and we can do this and we, we, we know what works and what didn't work from last time. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a long list and there's lots of things that will keep us very, very busy um, over the next year. And it's thinking for us as researchers uh, about how to kind of manage some of this. So I think it's the case that we've, we've built a strong network. We've got connections that were known in different communities, different constituencies mm -hmm. of the of local community. And that we've been able to deliver on some work um, already that we're getting a lot back, a lot more demand, mm. ideas for things that we could do, um, ideas for often quite um, practical interventions mm. that would have a direct outcome. I don't think that we're encountering a great deal of, wouldn't it be great to kind of do some sort of reimagining of, of the role of our school? It's, it's often about what are we going to do kind of next week and what do we want to do that will have an immediate impact. And we're getting lots and lots of that coming back and we're sort of I think that one of the things that I'm particularly concerned about 
is it's important to retain credibility mm. in the, amongst that community, amongst those contacts. So it's not enough to kind of um, loosely promise to deliver on something and not get there because, mm. that, because you're being relied on to deliver that research. So maintaining our credibility, um, delivering and, and, gi and giving back against what we're getting and managing this um, increasingly vibrant sort of um, demand for um, for engagement is a difficult thing to, to deal with and it's something that Sally and I, you know, email, email by email, day by day, are encountering at the moment. Okay, so I just want to finish off thinking about where I'd like to take some of this. Um, after Easter, the Whitley Transport, the Community Transport Report will be launched within the community. There'll be a community event and I will advertise it. So if anyone would like to come to that event, you'd be more than welcome. It will probably be in the evening. Um, and that will that bring about a kind of set of guidelines, if you like, and a plan for the community to invest in transport-related issues that they feel is important. But coming out of that, I also have an incredible data set now, a very rich data set from the grassroots about how people are living um, that go much beyond transport as well. It's about how people are getting by near austerity, about their family relationships, about, their kind of, about what it's like to live in a stigmatised and a disadvantaged community. And there are sort of four things, I think, for me that I'm going to be working on that sort of lead into my own sort of research agenda and I think feed very much into research agenda in school. The first I've already alluded to, it's about the chasm between work in the global south and the global north. And I think there's some really interesting work to be done and actually destabilizing some of that. And for me, it's about linking concepts. I recently gave a paper on the concepts of precarity and precariousness, which again has a, has a very, it's very much embedded in a lot of the discourses of the informal economy. Um, precarious livelihoods are those unstable, they're uncertain. Uh, they're people experiencing a lot of time poverty. And it's about thinking of how, about how those con concepts could actually be used to understand what's going on in our own communities, not just in communities and cities in the global south. But they might be different. They are going to be different because of wider political and kind of social concept. Um, it was interesting to read recently, there's a report by Joseph Roundtree Foundation about connecting communities. Uh, again, another report that says actually communities need to be connected. People need social relations, need social capital in order for things to work. Again, I can think back to all this work, body of work, right back into the 70s and 80s um, in, in the global south. But it's not really being critiqued. It's not really understanding the nature of social capital. Social capital, your networks can be negative as well as positive. So I think it's about building on some of that work in order to explore some of those more interesting things. And that's, that's, that's one point. Um, secondly, I'm interested in family. Family, and this links very much to our, one of our research themes in HERG, and we talked about that last week, about a sub-theme about families and communities getting by, what it means to do with families into household, intra household politics, the politics of extended families. A lot of the work um, that I've been looking at kind of bypasses this. Um, the work, you know, some of the detailed issues about working, going to school, about caring, um, are just becoming invisible within many of the kind of local policy discourses. Uh, one of the big problems for mobility and transport for women, particularly in, in Whitley, is the amount of time they spend on care that's not recognized. So if you live in an extended family network where you can't get anywhere, you know, and you have to take your elderly parents to the hospital at the same time you have to drop your children to nursery, you have a benefits meeting that you have to be at as well, otherwise you lose your money, those things are very stressful. And I think, again, well recognized in other parts of the world, but again, we're not, we're not, we're not dealing with this. And I think that attention to the micro geographies is something that's missing from the round report and some of the other connecting communities research that's been done by AHRC and some of the other kind of research bodies. I mean, I gave a paper on that recently in San Diego. Directly, and that says motility, as you can see that I would, Steve and I were typing this up very quickly before lunch. Um, coming out of this, there's a paper on everyday mobilities and the gendering of this. It's very little being written. Um, Sophie has just been talking to me about, you know, she's found a paper that was published in 2000 on the gendering of this and the kind of everyday issues that women deal in trying to, in space patching from Castells, you know, trying to do all this stuff at once. And, uh, and I think um, enabling women to be more mobile is key, actually, to other, um, to social exclusion, to tackling problems of poverty and things like that. And so there's a paper there. And then finally, I just organized an IBD, uh, IBD session with Rachel Payne uh, in, uh, for the forthcoming conference, which is actually about participation. 
and it's under sort of gender and justice because one of the things that's coming out of this, there's a gender dynamic to this as well, not just to some of our research findings. There's a gender dynamic in the sense that a lot of the Whitley researchers are female. A lot of them are doing volunteer, you know, they're volunteering. Again, big body of work on the triple burden in the global south. A community, women doing community as well as reproduction and productive work. It's happening here, but no one's really kind of critiquing that. Who are the people that are sitting on the, the big local and writing the reports in the community? The majority of them are women. And their roles, it's intersecting with their families. Okay, we're very family friendly. Most of a lot of our meetings, we've got children coming in or whatever. But we need to think about the extent to which women's unpaid labor and social reproduction is actually supporting development, communities, and issues of kind of power relations that go around that as well. And I think there's a lot to be said there. And I'm really excited that actually um, uh, the Mike Kesby, who actually writes a lot about participation, um, is actually going to come and present a paper in my session as well. So we're getting key people interested in impact and participation in those sessions as well. So for me, that's how I see some of the kind of research out of this kind of um, developing and hopefully it's kind of meeting um, a number of sort of objectives across the school and the university. So I don't want to talk about all the time for questions. I just want to um, finish by talking about two things that we're thinking about going forward. So the first is to say that one of the things that um, we are dealing with um, spending a lot of time dealing with at the moment in developing this research further is just how we manage the, the practicalities of doing this. How we get the kind of um, checks and um, procedures in place and how we negotiate the, um, the research ethics process, how we find space in which to sit people. This is taking an enormous amount of time at the moment um, and, and is, I know from my own experience of working with student researchers that you can't pay for, for various reasons previously, an enormously stressful experience. Mm. It's something that I think that we, we both feel at the moment is limiting what we can do. And, this is, and I'm not suggesting that, therefore, somebody in White Knight's house is going to solve this for us. It's something that we need to work, work around and we need to, put, um, uh, and we need to find way, ways of negotiating. But this is something that's taking a lot of our time at the moment, just the kind of practicalities and logistics of working in these sorts of ways. I think that we're also thinking about how we might frame the kind of knowledge that we're, um, that we're producing, that's being produced for, from, the, from the work that we're doing, and to what extent it might, um, it might constitute kind of mainstream um, academic research that could be valued in the same way that some of the other work that, um, that we've done is. I think that one of the things, it's something particularly around um, working with undergraduate researchers, the way that that gets valued, and the status that that has um, as, a, as a form of knowledge is something that we're also starting to apply to some of the work that's, um, that Sally's doing with the Whitley researchers, where sometimes it might have elements of um, kind of well, not best practice about it, but in other senses um, allows a kind of um, engagement and um, a kind of form of participation that we just, uh, as, as professionals, couldn't, couldn't achieve. So how we consider... Um, what our research is, is something that we're, we're also thinking about. I think the final thing that we want to say something about is, and something that we're thinking about a lot as well, is how we develop research capacity. So one thing that is increasingly apparent is that in working with undergraduate researchers, notwithstanding the excellent work that Dan did, is that simply there isn't the ability for people to hit the ground running. Um, and we spend a great deal of time, rather than doing the work that we want to do, actually doing kind of um, qualitative methods 201 with these people to try and get them research ready and it's not until the very end of the project um, that we're finding that we're, that we're really able to make headway. So, so it's starting to make, um, cause us to reflect on the way that we train researchers and as Sally said, the, the kind of um, training that we've done with community researchers and, and um, in, in developing um, capacity within Whitley to do research is something that we might want to bring across to training some of our own researchers too. Um, but certainly in developing capacity and the ability to do work like this, um, the, the kind of um, skills that researchers have are something that it's starting to lead us to focus on. So I think we'll stop I there. I think so, yeah. Um, um, thank you very much. We'll be delighted to take any questions. Thank you.